It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. So um, I actually knew of James long before I actually met him in person, both through his research and also his um, less research-oriented writings that have taken the world by storm. James has an incredible um, ability to uh, really dive into the heart of a matter and present it to everyone in a somewhat humorous fashion. So for those of you who have not ever read any of James' um, writings, I encourage you to check out not only his formal research papers, but also some of his less formal writings. Um, James comes to us right now from um, Microsoft Research, where he's been since 2008 when he got his PhD out of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He just spent the last fall down the river at MIT as a visiting professor. And James does research very broadly in the area of systems. And what I particularly like about both the research he does and the way he does systems research is the unusual breadth. So if you look at the kinds of papers he publishes, they range from storage to security to network systems. And the thing about it that makes it really different and I think really innovative and creative is that he's willing to tackle these systems problems at whatever place gives him the best leverage. So there are many in the systems community who would look at a title like building a better web browser and say, how can that possibly be a systems talk? But James manages to look at the very broad definition of systems and find really innovative and creative ways to tackle systems problems. And I think that that's a great lesson for all of us. So I think we're all in for a treat. I look forward to hearing what you have to say and welcome. Great, thanks. So is this, is this microphone on? Can we hear? Is it good in the back? OK. All right, so yes, the rumors are indeed true. My name is James. And today, I want to talk to you about how we can build better web browsers. Now, many of you might be thinking, my web browser already works fine. I take long walks on the beach with my web browser. I spend my evenings gazing into its eyes like I just fallen in love again. Now, you might say these things, and you might actually believe them. But here's the way that things really work, OK? <laughs> There's you, there's your web browser, and then there's the devil, okay? The platform that you use to access Facebook, Gmail, and CNN is actually possessed by demonic forces. And in this talk, I will, in fact, explain why. So the basic problem is control. So as a web developer, you often want your browser to do things that the browser won't allow you to do. Okay, your hands are tied in many ways. And this makes it hard for you to write web applications that are fast, secure, and robust. So for example, your browser has security holes, and you know that your browser has security holes, and the browser vendors know that there are security holes, but those browser vendors take too much time to fix those holes, and the browser does not allow you, the web developer, to directly patch those holes. And that's a problem. That gives you a sadness that haunts you as you try to fall asleep at night. <laughs> your browser has race conditions in it, as I'll show you today, and you'd like to be able to fix those race conditions, but the race conditions are so baked into the fundamental architecture of the web browser that it's difficult for you to work around them. And your web browser, the thing that some of you are using to check your email right now, it is, it is so muddled with respect to its architecture that it is hard to actually extract parallelism from all the cores in your machine that Intel keeps insisting that you need, right? And that's a problem because in principle, browsers actually offer many opportunities for concurrency. So how do we take this canonical browser architecture that I show you up here and make things better? You know, we've got content like HTML and CSS. Uh, and we've got software components like the rendering engine and the JavaScript engine. So how do we take all this stuff and give web developers more control? Well, I'm not the only person who's recognized that web browsers are broken in some pretty fundamental ways. So there have been a variety of projects that have looked at how to redesign web browsers. So people know that something is wrong. However, the solutions that people are devising don't address this fundamental issue of control. And so as a result, we still have a lot of problems. So for example, browsers like Chrome and OP, they take the renderer process, uh, sorry, the renderer and the parser and the JavaScript engine that belong uh, to uh, a particular origin, and they isolate it in a process. And so if you have multiple tabs, you get multiple processes. Now this is nice because if a tab uh, crashes or gets corrupted, the rest of your tabs are actually going to be OK. So this is a nice feature. To be clear, this is actually forward progress, right? The problem is that the browser is still fundamentally speaking using that same monolithic architecture. Okay, so this means that web pages themselves still don't have the ability to patch security holes themselves. They don't have the ability to fix bugs in that monolithic, monolithic uh, software stack. 
So as another example, consider the Servo project. So Servo is Mozilla's research browser, which tries to add more concurrency to various parts of the browser. Okay, so once again, this is a very laudable goal. They're trying to take advantage of all these cores that we have on the machine. However, once again, Servo is still using the traditional monolithic browser architecture, right? So there will still be weird race conditions between the render and the JavaScript engine because the abstractions that these components present are still fundamentally unchanged. And this means it's still difficult for web pages to understand and control their runtime environment. So in summary, the problem is that people take that monolithic architecture as a given, even in research projects whose goal it is to give you a better web browser. And so the result is that we still grapple with fundamental issues of security, performance, and robustness, right? Issues that arise because browsers uh, prevent web developers from taking control over their browser runtime. So how do we address this lack of control? Allow me to answer the question I've just asked myself. So to answer this question, we have to think about what a web browser is fundamentally trying to do. Okay? At a basic level, browsers provide services to origins in the same way that operating systems provide services to processes. And for those of you who are not familiar with the, uh, with the web, uh, an origin is basically a three-tuple uh, representing a protocol, a host name, and a port. Uh, so in this example, the protocol is uh, HTTP, and the host is x.com, and the port is 8080. So typically in URLs, the port is something that's implicitly specified. So for example, a port of 80 for HTTP. So anyways, so if we look at a web page, uh, we'll see that behind the scenes, there are execution contexts that belong to origins. So for example, in this page up here, uh, we might have a context belonging to x.com, another one for y.com, and a, yet a third for z.com. So the job of the browser is to provide render, computation, and I.O for each one of these origins and to provide a messaging layer that allows these origins to communicate. Okay, so that's fine. So that's what browsers need to do at this sort of fundamental platonic level. But what are we actually asking them to do today in practice? So, okay, so in the render API, the browser has to support HTML and CSS and MathML in case you want to put formulas in your web page, has to support ARIA for accessibility and WebGL for fancy graphics and video tags for fancy videos and the Canvas API to support bitmap manipulations and all kinds of image formats like JPEG and PNG. And in the IO stack, we have to support XML HTTP requests and DOM storage for persistent storage and IndexedDB for persistent storage and cookies for smaller amounts of persistent storage and the file reader and the browser cache and the app cache. And I would talk about the compute interface, but I've run out of time on the slide and related news I am freaking out dude okay I'm freaking out about all these API's right that list of API's is getting bigger and bigger every day so let's take a step back all right and look at this list up here okay so we'll see that browsers are indeed providing services to origins however we will also see that those services are high level and complex there's a ton of stuff in the trusted computing base for the browser now, that's not good for security because it means that the threat surface for the browser is very large. It's not good for robustness because it means that the browser has to implement a ton of services in a way that has to please a ton of different web pages. And putting all this stuff in the browser isn't good for performance because it means that the browser can't focus on doing a few things well. So the browser basically has too much control over too many things. It has to do all that stuff up here. So you wouldn't ask an operating system to implement Emacs in the kernel. So similarly, a lot of these, well, some of you might. <laughs> that was a test, actually. I've already called the police, so yeah, <laughs> laugh it up now. So the more reasonable people in the audience would not implement Emacs in the kernel. <laughs> similarly, a lot of these web specs up here should not be implemented by the browser itself. But to fix the browser, we need to radically restructure the browser architecture. Imagine a world in which I had such an architecture, right? We actually live in this world, not this fireball world, which is just a metaphor. But I mean, we, it's, we can talk about that offline if that's confusing. Anyways, here's what I propose. So I propose that we refactor the current browser architecture. So in particular, I propose that we dramatically narrow the responsibilities of the browser itself and give more responsibilities to web pages. So in this new model, the web developer defines her own rendering engine and her own script engine and her own markup parser. If the developer wants to fix bugs or add new features or patch security holes, she just does it. She has the control. Now the software stack that she defines, it can be rich and it can be uh, complex, but it is actually untrusted by the browser and it's strongly isolated from the browser and from other web stacks that other developers uh, define. 
Now, each of those application-defined stacks communicates with the browser using an RPC interface. Okay, that interface is narrow, and it's also low-level. And so what that means is that it's easy to reason about its properties. And it's also thread-safe, meaning that applications can invoke browser APIs in a parallel way to get better performance. Now, the browser itself is trusted, similar to how an operating system kernel is trusted. However, the browser is strongly isolated as well, and it's also small, providing only a few low-level services for rendering computation in I.O. And internally, it uses concurrent threads to maximize performance. So this all may seem nice and good to you, but you might look at this architecture and think, aren't we just moving bits around, right? I mean, I showed you this nice animation. We had a bunch of components here, and then some went up and some went down. I drew a dashed line between them, but the careful observer will note that the total number of chairs is unchanged. Congratulations, you may have what it takes to make it at Harvard. But what I hope to show you is that even if we do have the same number of chairs, even if a web page does have to implement things like the render and the scripting engine itself, it is now easier for the web page to define those components because we've provided a smaller, cleaner set of abstractions with which to implement uh, those components. So the main contribution of the work that I'll discuss today is Atlantis, which is a new browser which uses the refactoring that I just described. Uh, by allowing web developers to define that higher level runtime, Atlantis gives developers more control. In turn, this increased amount of control simultaneously allows web developers to increase the security, performance, and robustness of their pages. Right? So for example, I'll describe how Atlantis makes it easier to fix bugs in the current web stack or take advantage of uh, the multi-cores that you have on your machine. And more interestingly, I'll also show you how Atlantis makes it easier for web developers to experiment with new types of runtimes that look nothing like the current uh, web technologies of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And this is a really neat feature because it allows web developers to innovate without sort of waiting to get permission from the browser vendors who currently right now are the people who control all the innovation. So before I describe the Atlantis architecture in more detail, let me give you some specific examples uh, of how current browser architectures make you hate life. Uh, and then after I basically depress you, I will then lift you back up again. And I will show you why there is actually some minimum amount of hope where minimum may be defined in terms of an epsilon, but whatever. It's not completely bad. So first, I want to focus on concurrency. Now, as I've mentioned, a web browser offers many opportunities to execute tasks in parallel. So for example, we can imagine a browser which breaks HTML uh, into chunks and parses those chunks in parallel. We can imagine a browser which wants to handle I.O. requests in parallel, and so on and so forth. Um, now, unfortunately, current browser architectures limit how much concurrency we can extract in practice. And furthermore, browsers provide these very strange concurrency semantics that make you feel like you're trapped in a bad romantic relationship. So let me give you an example of that. So suppose that we want our browser to be able to do three things in parallel. Execute JavaScript code, update the visual layout, and handle IOs. Now, a straw man design is to allocate a thread for each task and use locks to guarantee that uh, these threads modify each other's data structures uh, in sort of a safe way. So that seems reasonable, right? That's sort of the, the, the straightforward design. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Now, the web standards define this thing called the DOM that defines how JavaScript code interacts with the rest of the browser. DOM is just an abbreviation for the document object model. So according to the DOM, JavaScript execution is single-threaded, and JavaScript code cannot see locks that are inside the layout thread or the I.O. stack. Okay, so that, that's fine so far. Now, what this should mean is that when JavaScript code is executing, no other thread should be able to access the DOM. Right? This will ensure that the JavaScript code always sees a consistent version of the DOM. So this is what should happen. Now, what actually happens is not that. Right? Okay. That's a technical term of art from science, not that. So uh, what actually happens is that you can get these crazy race conditions. So for example, let's consider this data structure called uh, the DOM tree. So the DOM tree is the JavaScript representation of a page's HTML tags. So each tag is represented by a DOM node in the JavaScript world. Uh, so imagine that we had the JavaScript code that I show you uh, up here. So first we create a new image. We assign a new source uh, to that image. And then we insert that image into the DOM tree. Now at this point, uh, only JavaScript code needs to be accessing the DOM because it needs to add that image DOM node up there. Okay. So that's what should be happening. 
And so if we actually had this single threaded execution semantics, if we had this loop up here where we loop on some property of that image, that loop is going to execute forever. Because the only way we could figure out the height of that image is if somehow the layout and the IO thread independently at the same time went out, got the actual image bits, updated the DOM tree, and then set the width or the height to whatever the actual width and height of the image are. Now, unfortunately, we do not get these nice properties because what ends up happening is that in parallel, the IO thread goes out, fetches the bits for the image. Then the layout thread actually updates the DOM tree and changes the width and height of the image such that if we had this alert down here, right, this would actually fire. That loop would actually exit because there are actually concurrent accesses that are not protected by threads taking place up here. So this is basically a big bummer, right? Because this makes it difficult to write robust, robust web applications. Yeah, it's a big bummer. It's not exactly what you want to happen. No, no, not at all. Because if you can't see locks on the other side, you don't want things to be concurrently updating data structures that you can access. Well, what I want is for there not to be bugs, such as like somebody can write a JavaScript, you know, a, a mistake in their JavaScript that causes the page to never render. Uh, that is also bad. <laughs> so we're not disagreeing, but like this kind of Why thing, is this, this is, terrible. excuse me? You're the devil. I'm the devil? <laughs> I am not the devil. Why am I the devil? I'm the, no, 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 because JavaScript says, okay, if what you're arguing is you should not write infinite loops, yes, that is correct. <laughs> and if you're arguing that I am in fact a cranky old man, the answer is yes to that as well. <laughs> But now note that I am not the only person who thinks that these subtle concurrency bugs actually cause bugs in real pages. You're correct that that example I showed you was a bit contrived because you should not put an infinite loop in code that you care about. But there are actually other examples which are more difficult to explain, which describe how in more realistic pages these things can actually bite you. But suffice it to say that that loop up there shows you that you have real race conditions which are not fun. Uh, and for other people who want uh, evidence that I'm not the devil, thanks Eddie. Uh, <laughs> I encourage you to read this paper up here. I encourage you, I am not Petrov from PLDI 2012. Uh, now, suffice it to say, I just showed you an example of race conditions. Uh, and so uh, that's kind of a bummer. So why does this happen at a high level? Well, I think at a high level, the reason why this happens is because browsers are riddled with these things that I call idiosyncratic abstractions, trademark James Macon's 2015. So an idiosyncratic abstraction is an abstraction that is inconsistently applied throughout the system or it's one that's applied consistently but does not provide a coherent software model to the developer. So an example is what I just showed you. So for example, this notion that JavaScript execution is single threaded. As it turns out, this isn't actually the case. Now, if web developers controlled their high level runtime, they could just fix these problems in a way that sort of made sense for their application. However, current browsers don't let you do this. So let me give you one other quicker example of an idiosyncratic abstraction that makes your life terrible. And this particular, uh, problem is with security. So this attack involves the HTML5 screen sharing API. So the basic idea is that the user on the left can go to some website and then share the visual contents of the browser directly with another user on the right without having to go through Pinterest or another popular tool for sharing stupid images of food. So basically screen sharing is it's a screen scraping mechanism, right? So unfortunately there's a problem. Uh, so the uh, attack involves uh, the way that the browser binds resources to origins. So let's just focus on one browser for now. So suppose that the attacker has managed to trick the user into visiting uh, an attacker-controlled site, for example, by getting the user to click on a malicious ad. Now, the attacker site can ask the user for permission to screen share. Okay? Now, if the user says yes, the screen sharing API now lets the attacker uh, page capture data from different origins. Okay? So, for example, the attacker page can quickly open a child frame to, let's say, a banking website, try to screen scrape sensitive pixels from that banking site, and then close that frame before the user can ever detect what's happened. So, what browsers are supposed to do is bind resources to origins. Right? Browsers are supposed to pre uh, prevent different origins from tampering with their resources. Now, this is known as the same origin policy, or the SOP. So what should happen in this screen scraping example is that the SOP should prevent the attacker frame from inspecting the pixels of the banking website. Now, what does happen right, is not that. 
Okay, so in fact what happens is that the attacker site is allowed to steal those pixels from the banking website. And so once again, the problem is that we have these idiosyncratic abstractions. Okay, so this stuff was super depressing. Now, unfortunately modern browsers are riddled with these idiosyncratic abstractions. So what are we going to do about it? And I want to take a step back for a second and answer sort of a, a thought that many of you probably have, which is you think, okay, fine, web browsers are broken, but maybe that's just because the people who build them are just like bad coders. Why can't we use better software engineering to fix the problem, right? And yes, of course, better software engineering is always better. And in related news, yep, that's a pigeon. <laughs> That's another observation, which is not quite as useful as it might seem at first, right? So sort of tautologically speaking, yeah, we want to make these browsers better architected, but if you go out and you look at the size of the HTML spec, it is a thousand pages. Just the HTML spec, it's a thousand pages. The CSS spec is over 400 pages, okay? We're getting into like EU constitution length documents here, okay? <laughs> And those are just two of the specs that the browser has to implement, and these specs talk about each other. They refer to each other. They have to interoperate. So yes, better software engineering is always better, but the first order of business, I claim, is taking those huge specs out of our trusted computing base and, let app and letting the applications implement these things, or parts of those specs, in a way that is appropriate for those applications. And so these observations uh, lead us to Atlantis. So perhaps the best way to understand the Atlantis architecture is by analogy. So up here we see what a single process Linux application might look like. We've got a low level library like libc that acts as the interface between uh, the kernel and the application. There's a higher level application framework like Qt that provides more advanced data structures, GUI widgets, so on and so forth. Uh, and then at the top we have the application specific uh, code and data. Now, here's what a web page looks like in Atlantis. So at the bottom, we have the browser kernel, which provides low-level services for a network, UI, and storage. Uh, the kernel also creates these things that we call principal instances. So a principal instance is just a container for the code and the data that belong to a particular origin, like CNN or Facebook. A principal instance resides in a single process that can have uh, multiple threads. Now, importantly, all of this stuff up here in the white boxes is controlled by the page itself not by the browser. And that's because the browser itself is agnostic to that higher level application runtime. So, for example, the web page itself provides its own HTML parser and its own CSS parser and its own implementation of things like the rendering engine. The web page itself provides the high level of JavaScript runtime. And all of these components interact with the outside world using that narrow browser API but the browser itself doesn't know about any of the details of the stuff at the higher level. And that's neat because this means that the application itself is free to define a runtime that looks nothing like the traditional web stack. So in fact, if you want, you can have a Haskell runtime up there and you can put the LaTeX markup and rendering stack atop of your Haskell runtime, then you can go poison the water supply or do whatever it is that people <laughs> who want that kind of stack are gonna do with their time. And the point is that you as the application developer, because you control that high level web stack, you can basically modify it in any way that you want. So for example, let's say that you don't like the default usenix.sty rendering engine. Well, you control the code for that rendering engine yourself. So look at that, column step of 0 0.25 inches, that's just too big. You can go in there, you can modify that, right? Maybe you want to set that to 0.0. .0. Now you've got your own custom usenix.sty rendering engine. You've removed that unnecessary white space from your page. And it's almost certainly going to pass the format checker. Look, I don't do that kind of stuff. I'm an educator. I just want you to know that that kind of thing is possible, right? So. The point is that you, as the web developer, control that web stack so you can define it and modify it as you see fit. And as you might be able to imagine, a single browser can actually run multiple origin containers. So for example, if a site has multiple frames, each frame will reside in a separate container. Now, at this point in the talk, we actually have enough context to discuss uh, what the browser API looks like. And by the browser API, I mean the dark arrows in this picture. So those arrows represent the interfaces by which a web page interacts uh, with the outside world. Now those interfaces need to be expressive enough to support the features that modern web pages uh, expect. However, those interfaces need to be narrow enough to keep the browser small, fast, and secure. So here are the main interfaces uh, that the browser defines. With respect to computation, the browser allows a web page to create a new principal instance where that new principal is named by a URL. 
The browser also allows a page to send a message to another principal instance, as well as receive messages from other principals. So these APIs are sufficient to implement legacy features like frames, post message, and uh, cross-frame bindings like window.parent. With respect to storage, the browser defines a simple key value interface. Uh, each origin is associated with sort of a private key value store, um, which allows people to implement legacy imp uh, interfaces like DOM storage, IndexedDB, a file reader, so on and so forth. With respect to networking, the main primitive is pretty simple. Uh, the browser allows a page to open an HTTP stream uh, that's associated with a particular URL. Now using that call, you can do things like write your own uh, markup parser that's going to fetch external objects. Uh, and you can also implement things like the legacy uh, AJAX interface. And finally, the browser provides mechanisms to interact with the user. So for example, render image allows a page to draw a bitmap to the screen. And the listen GUI interface allows a page to receive uh, user input events from the mouse and the keyboard. And these interfaces allow a page to implement legacy components like the layout engine, the DOM tree, so on and so forth. Now, of course, you don't have to use the Atlantis API to just implement these legacy features, right? So as I mentioned, one of the big advantages of Atlantis is that it allows you to sort of experiment with new runtimes. But I mentioned this here just to describe how a small number of browser APIs are sufficient to actually implement a lot of powerful functionality, including all of these services that a traditional monolithic browser provides, right? All this stuff just boils down to a few browser interfaces. Now, of course, this perhaps seems too easy. You might think, why did James Mickens figure this out when others could not? And the answer is that I'm a wizard from a fireball planet. <laughs> the answer has been staring you in the face the entire talk, right? But more seriously, uh, I think that the browser community has essentially implicitly accepted this notion that if we want high performance and rapid innovation in web browsers, then I guess we probably have to tolerate a grotesque browser architecture. And I'm trying to show that's not actually true. Right? It is true, I think, that if you want bare metal performance, then yes, you will probably have to come up with some very sort of low-level, grotesque things to get that bare metal performance. But I think in many cases, A, you don't need that bare metal performance. So all you undergrads out there who only code in C, get hip, OK? It's not going to work out for you. And second of all, you can actually get very good performance, right? even if you have a nice, cleaner architecture. So this is what Atlantis looks like. It's a small, trusted browser and a bunch of uh, data and code that's provided by a web page. But what exactly does the code in that web page look like? So up to this point, I haven't actually said anything about that, right? It could be maybe rawx86 or Java bytecodes or you know, maybe even a JavaScript, heaven forbid. So from the perspective of giving control back to web developers, it actually doesn't matter that much, right? So as long as we restrict the page to accessing the world through the browser API, we're fine. However, it would be nice, actually, if a web page's code in the Atlantis world had the following properties. For example, one nice feature about the current web stack is that it's easy to inspect a page's high-level source code. It'd be nice if we could preserve this uh, property in Atlantis, uh, which makes x86 or bytecodes uh, sort of less attractive. Uh, we'd also like to ensure that a page's executable code is highly compressible to minimize the network cost of transferring that code to the browser. We want that code to be fast to validate and optimize so that we can ensure that it's well-behaved and well-formed. And we'd also like for that code to be amenable to fine-grade code updating. Right? Such that if you change one little thing in a piece of code, you don't have to sort of re-download re the entire thing. And we'd also like for our stuff to be portable across multiple hardware architectures. So as it turns out, there is a code format that has all these nice properties, abstract syntax trees. Right? So in Atlantis, a page specifies its code in terms of abstract syntax trees, or ASTs. And this is what Atlantis actually executes. Now, at first glance, this might seem insane. Right? Uh, but I promise you that ASTs really do have these nice properties. And I'll actually defer you to papers that discuss this in more depth for more details about some of these things. But at a high level, for example, ASTs allow you to do things like, uh, for example, do compression based on run length encoding of popular production rules in the AST. Right? So these things are not as easy to do with high level source code. And compared to high level source code, uh, ASTs also sort of get rid of the, uh, like the, the, the lexing and the parsing process. That's sort of done offline. So it's actually easier to um, compile these things as well. So anyways, I defer to you uh, to the paper shown here for more details. And in case uh, you have skipped your compiler class, uh, let me remind you what an AST looks like. So basically, we have some high level source code up here, in this case, a function just to add two numbers. And then we see the AST, this tree structure down there. It basically is just a, a data structure that captures the high level semantics um, 
of the applicant of, of that function. And so uh, in Atlantis, it's these AST things down here, or serialized versions of them, that the browser actually executes. But AST could be AST for x86, or AST for JavaScript, or AST for C code, or AST for? Yeah, so I'll describe the features of those ASTs in, in a second. Uh, so if we return uh, to the Atlantis architecture, we'll see that the browser, we'll see that we have uh, the browser kernel at the bottom, and then inside of the principal instance, we have this thing that we call the siphon interpreter. So the siphon interpreter is that software component that executes the ASTs. Uh, and so to get to some of uh, perhaps your question, like you know, what, what do these ASTs sort of look like? So at a high level, um, it is a little bit TypeScriptist like. So we've got things like strong types, for example, which is very uh, handy. But it also natively supports multi-threading, which is actually a, a nice advantage over JavaScript, which is you know single threaded inside of a, a given frame. And uh, Cy uh, Siphon also allows a page to distinguish between privileged and unprivileged code. So basically, you know, a page can define a bunch of code at the beginning, which can directly make browser calls. And then the page can say, I don't want any code defined after this point to be able to make browser calls. And that kind of allows a page to make its own equivalent of libc, basically. So to force all the browser calls to go through this initial trusted component. Um, so anyway, so that's basically a high level 10,000 foot view of Siphon. If you have more questions, we can talk about that uh, maybe in the Q&A session. So, all right, so at this point, uh, we have enough information in our heads to look at an end-to-end -end example of how Atlantis loads a web page. So the browser is sitting around, and then, hey, there was some weird lady hiding behind my wall. That's a problem with security. We'll deal with that later. Anyways, she's like, hey, I want to go to this site, foo.com. Okay, fine. So the browser kernel first uh, creates a principal instance, and then it's going to put a, a siphon interpreter inside. Then the kernel is going to fetch that top-level content for the requested page. The kernel is going to scan that content, and it's going to look for something called the environment tag. Now, a page uses the environment tag to define its high-level runtime. So here's what an environment tag might look like. So the browser starts to parse the environment tag, and the first thing that it finds is this thing called the compiler option. So the compiler is the thing which translates the page's executable code into those siphon ASTs I was telling you about. Now, note that the compiler itself has to be directly written uh, in this AST format. So the browser downloads the compiler code, and then it continues to parse the environment tag. The next thing that it finds is the markup parser option. So the markup parser is the thing that processes the pages, HTML or LaTeX or whatever, um, and then does stuff as a result. So for example, drawing to the screen or executing code. Um, so the browser downloads the markup parser, which in this case is written in JavaScript. The browser uh, then uses the compiler to generate a siphon version uh, of the markup parser, which the browser can directly execute. The browser continues to parse the environment tag and finds the runtime option. So the runtime option specifies uh, the code which will provide the application's equivalent of libc or qt or whatever. So the browser downloads that runtime, which in this case is also implemented in JavaScript. The browser compiles it, generating the equivalent siphon ASTs. And at this point, there's nothing else left in the environment tag. So at this point, the kernel simply hands uh, the rest of the page's markup to the page provided markup parser and then steps out of the way. So the page provided parser is going to generate the rest of the page content in an application specific way. Then at this point, voila, we're done. The page has basically been loaded. Now note that we want to have some story for backwards compatibility, right? So like normal web pages are not going to have that environment tag in it, right? So what we can do is that if Atlantis does not find that environment tag at the top, it can basically provide that backwards compatible stack just by default. And this defines all of the hardness of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that the sadists out there occasionally demand. So that's very nice because we have this great story for allowing both extensibility and backwards compatibility. And by the way, if something happens to me after this talk, it was her. Okay. <laughs> she kidnapped me. It's a problem. Memorize that face. Be prepared to describe it to a police sketch artist. Okay. I'm very fragile. So anyways. What I want you to note is that in the common case, the average web developer does not have to write uh, that entire high-level web stack. So instead, developers will typically use these off-the-shelf web stacks and tweak them as necessary. So for example, you might use Google Stack, or you might use a version of Facebook Stack that you modify yourself, or you might sort of take the best parts of Facebook Stack and the Google Stacks. So as a developer, this will feel very similar to how now, when you want to develop a web page, you decide if you want jQuery, or you want Angular, or you, know, you want something like that. So that's how Atlantis works. And so now I want to evaluate Atlantis along a couple of different axes. Uh, 
So first, I want to look at how much bigger an Atlantis page is than a regular page. Because remember that in Atlantis, we're actually asking the page itself to implement more code, right? So a natural question is, you know, how much bigger do pages become, right? And so it is true that Atlantis does make the page bigger. However, the first thing to keep in mind is that caching uh, through the browser cache uh, basically saves 81% of bytes and 75% of requests on average. Okay, so what that means is that typically most or all of that high-level runtime is going to hit in the cache. So even if I showed you a number that showed that the you know the, the runtime is like one gig large, you know after that one gig is downloaded, you're good to go. Now of course. I've set this up such that you're expecting a number much smaller for the web stack, right? That was intentional. I practiced that in the mirror. So uh, how big is the actual runtime stack in practice? So here's the size for that legacy web stack, which I showed you from a couple slides ago, right? In other words, if a page wants to run in this sort of backwards compatible mode, this is what it would have to include, right? And so this graph up here shows the size of the compressed ASTs that are actually sent over the wire. So for example, um, the HTML parser was about 280K and the JavaScript runtime uh, was about 200K. And so note that the average web page today is about 1.6 megs in size. So if the browser has a totally cold cache, Atlantis makes the page roughly 47% better. However, as I mentioned, this is sort of a worst case number because typically the cache is warm. How did you make the parser to the runtime? How did I make them? Yeah. Oh, so. And translate to them to an AST, or did you write them? That's one thing that you could do. No, we actually I did it from first principles by looking at the spec. But there are tools which allow you to, for example, take C code, like in Scripten you may have heard of, or things like this, and then compile it down to JavaScript. So that's one option we decided not to take because as it turns out that tool chain is fairly fragile, um, and we wanted to avoid some of that. Uh, over there? Uh, you mentioned yeah. It takes four hours to compile. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. What happens if you actually want to use WebKit? Well, so you're saying, what, what if I actually want to use the full-blown sort of WebKit with all its gnarly features? I mean, you could do that. I mean, there's nothing that prevents you from doing that. I mean, one reason why we get a little, uh, a bit of a, a nice size reduction here is because we have that siphon interpreter, right, which can actually sort of um, help with some things like image rendering, for example, because it can provide like some higher level interfaces to the bitmap engine. But you could definitely do something like that. And in fact, people do things like that today with things like ASM.js, if you've heard of that. So people try to do things like uh, compile the Quake uh, engine down the JavaScript. And they don't laugh. This is the world we live in, OK? It's filled with sickos, right? And they try to run it in the browser. So long story short, yes, you can do that. I think it would be less efficient in terms of speed, but it, it's possible. Isn't there another issue with the, without all the optimizations that are in the browser right now, like the JavaScript engine and their, and like their rendering and stuff, it would be a lot slower, right? You use a lot more CPU without, like you're sending an unoptimized code and it could well, be different for every website. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so one thing that's nice about the interpreter is that it can do things like jitting, for example, right? But you're right that if, if all you did was just send over, you know, raw ASTs that didn't have things like JIT in it, then straight line code execution would be much slower. As it turns out, though, straight line code execution is typically not the most important thing in a browser. Like, we do have a JIT, but it's typically uh, a, lot, a lot of times these JIT numbers are for what they call benchmarking, right? So that people like Gizmodo get excited about stuff. If you look at what a browser actually does, it's typically not raw execution speed that's important. It's how quickly it can execute a series of event handlers, right? So imagine like a game that was firing a bunch of animation callbacks or that was handling a bunch of GUI uh, inputs. That's typically the key thing to look at in terms of performance. But you're exactly right that we do need JITs to keep things efficient. So you mentioned like uh, backwards compatibility. So yeah, in the future, if everyone is using Atlantis and someone loads a page that doesn't have this environment tag, it'll still work. So in that transition period, before everybody moves to Atlantis, if I open one of these pages using Chrome, what happens? If you open... If like a page that has this environment tag. Oh, you're saying like if, if, if you have an Atlantis aware ta uh, page yeah, exactly. that, yeah, so that will, well, let me tell you what, what could happen, which involves code that I did not write, uh, but what you can imagine happening, right? So what you can imagine happening is that the page itself would detect that, you know, it's, it's running on a browser that does not support extensibility, and then it could dynamically load this legacy web stack that we have and essentially create its own virtualized environment, if you will, that runs atop something like IE. Now, I did not write that code, but that's the story that you would actually have if you wanted to support things like that during that transition period. Cool. Uh, next, I want to describe how Atlantis makes it easier to provide deny by default same origin policy enforcement. And I want to situate this uh, discussion in the context of the screen sharing attack that I mentioned earlier. 
So in Atlantis, an origin has to explicitly give permission for external entities to access local resources. So suppose that the browser is running three different principal instances, and suppose that the instance on the left is subverted by a malevolent force. Okay, maybe you click on that link to win an iPad, you want a virus instead. We've all been there. I'm not going to judge you. Okay, things do get better. So. That principal instance over there is subverted. Now, that subverted instance can goof around with its own bitmap, and it can register its GUI handlers for its own bitmap, and so on and so forth. However, it cannot directly tamper with resources that belong to other principal instances, because they're all strongly isolated. So the worst that this thing can do is try to send malicious RPC messages to those other principal instances. However, if you assume that other principal instances are reasonable and don't just sort of do arbitrary things when sort of unexpected RPC messages show up, then nothing should be able to uh, happen to those other two principal instances, right? So by default, things like the screen sharing attack should not work, uh, assuming that other principal instances do sort of the minimally reasonable thing. So now I want to discuss one of the uh, greatest features of Atlantis, namely the extensibility, right? Now by extensible, I mean that a web page, I'm memorize that face, I'm telling you. <laughs> by extensibility, I mean that web pages can change the behavior of the high level runtime, either to fix bugs, add new features, or in this case, to add new runtime checks that make a page more secure. So once again, here's the architecture for a regular browser. Now, what you'll see is that the renderer and the JavaScript engine have two separate object heaps, okay? The JavaScript engine has a heap for JavaScript objects, and the renderer has a heap for the C++ objects that it manages, okay? So objects in different heaps can't directly inspect each other's state. So if the JavaScript object at the bottom wants to talk to the C++ object on the left, the JavaScript object has to send an RPC to the C++ heap. Okay, so for example, those DOM nodes that I mentioned to you at the beginning of the talk, right? There's a JavaScript version of a DOM node, then there's a backing version for it in the C++ object. So when the JavaScript world manipulates DOM node properties, it's actually generating these RPCs. And so an example of such an RPC is the inner HTML interface, right? So when JavaScript code assigns something to the inner HTML interface, the renderer will dynamically inject that string as HTML into the page. Now, this is obviously a dangerous interface, right? Because that string could come from an untrusted entity like the user, a malicious script, so on and so forth. So as a web developer, we would like the ability to interpose on the inner HTML inter interface. Now, this should be easy, OK? Because the JavaScript world has an extremely nice model for reflection and dynamic object modification. So we should be able to do something like this. And of course, at every point in this talk when I've said should, some disaster happens, right? So don't be disappointed when that's what happens. So here's what we should be able to do, is execute pseudocode that looks like that. We should be able to get a reference to the original version of innerHTML, stash it away somewhere, and then define a new version, a wrapped version, which sanitizes the input string, and then calls the original innerHTML. So JavaScript tells us that such introspection is possible. So this should work, right? Nope. Nope is an exclamation which indicates that something is completely and utterly impossible. So for example, can we use JavaScript shimming in the expected manner? Nope. The shimming interfaces can break hidden invariants. So let me show you what I mean. So if we look at the C++ heap, we'll see that the C++ heap has a bunch of pointers that the JavaScript world doesn't know about. Okay? So some of these pointers refer to C++ objects, uh, but some of them actually refer uh, to JavaScript objects, like the inner HTML RPC stub. So, if we shim the inner HTML stub, we actually break an invariant in the C++ heap, right? The C++ world expects inner HTML to point to the original value, not to the shimmed version that we just created. So if you try to execute that shimming code, your browser will eventually throw uh, some cryptic exception that doesn't really make sense, right? And so this is a bummer, right? The take home point is that in a regular browser, or even in other research browsers like server or OP, JavaScript developers cannot see many invariants. Right? which makes very reasonable things actually open up a portal to a demon world. Right? However, in Atlantis, those problems go away because web developers themselves are the ones who control almost all those invariants. And this means that adding new features in Atlantis is actually easy and robust. So suppose that I'm a web developer and I want a DOM tree implementation that sanitizes inner HTML strings. I don't need society's permission to dress like a vigilante and get justice. Okay? I just go out there, I modify the DOM tree myself, Right? And then my page just automatically gets better. Right? Because don't forget, I control both the renderer and the scripting engine. Okay? There's a single unified heap that I manage. So there aren't any hidden invariants between the renderer and the scripting engine. 
Now, of course, there is a renderer, right? There is a scripting engine. We haven't gotten rid of those, but as I mentioned before, Atlantis provides cleaner abstractions with which to build those components. So we haven't gotten rid of any of the chairs, but in many cases, we've made those chairs smaller, right? Because it's easier to write clean code and there are fewer corner cases to worry about. So for example, I actually took Atlantis's default runtime stack and I actually added an inner HTML shimming and it only took a few lines of code and it was great. And then I high five myself because I believe in thinking positively, okay? <laughs> so what was great about this is that I didn't have to wait for Mozilla or Firefox or Google to update their browser, right, to add this nice security feature. I just did it myself, then I felt like a million bucks, right? That's fantastic, right? As another example, what if I'm a web developer and I want my page to use a new rendering algorithm that uses threads to calculate bounding boxes in parallel? In the current world, I have to wait for the browser vendors to do this, right? In Atlantis, browser vendors are not my parents. They don't tell me what to do, right? I control all that stuff, so I just go out and I go do it. I make my pages faster in a way that's appropriate for my application, and I'm just, I'm done. I'm happy. What's the story, though, on, you have a bug in the code that's distributed across a zillion pages. If you have a bug in the code that's distributed across a zillion pages. You've added code to all these pages. So, for example, like if, if there's some, def it, excuse me? Google site that's Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. So if there's a problem with that high-level runtime that Google provides, let's say, then you can look at that code and just change it directly. Right? Now, your question may be like, well, but are mom and pop shops really going to do that? So, for example, is like, you know, something in the long tail of the web actually going to have that? that aren't going to change, right? So, you're going to have to. That's true, but note that we only have to have one person be willing to fix that bug and then update, you know, the canonical version of it in a repo somewhere. Then everybody can leverage that. But you're, but you're exactly right that the common case is not that every web developer writes one of these web stacks. In the same sense that like, if you look at like, how many jQuery sort of clones are there, not very many, right? And so similarly, you know, if you download jQuery, you don't like something about it, if someone in the internet changes it, then you get to leverage that. So it'll be the same thing for these high-level stacks. What kind of malicious things are possible for the runtime stack to do uh, in, in Atlantis? Like, impersonate like your native applications, like things like that that might, might be tricky to users? Well, I mean, so if you use, if you, if, you, if you are in love with the default web stack for some disturbing reason, right, then you know you're going to have some of these weird sort of same origin issues or, or sort of like cross-site scripting things or things like that just because you're still bound to like this notion of, you know, there's still vectors like inner HTML, right? And if you didn't shim that stuff, in your custom stack, then it still might be possible for a malicious web page to sort of inject content in a way that you don't think is kosher. So we don't get rid of sort of bugs um, that are sort of endemic to origin confusions in the traditional web stack per se, but we do offer a nicer isolation model, for instance, such that we can actually constrain the badness that happens if you get tripped up by one of those issues. But if you wanted to really avoid those issues, then it's actually easy in this world to define a new stack which you know, doesn't even allow some of these interfaces that are sort of plaguing people today. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to plow forward, um, and then you know, we can have a Q&A. I don't know if people typically end things uh, on time here, uh, but I'm from the West Coast, so I'm you know, very leisurely with these types of things. So anyways, so, so yeah, so if you want something like a parallel rendering algorithm, you just go out there and you implement it, and you can do that because the code belongs to you. And what if you want your web pages to, to access persistent storage using a SQL interface or a file system interface or something else? Well, guess what? It's my party. I'll storage if I want to. Atlantis provides fast, thread-safe key value storage that's safely partitioned by origin. So a web page can implement arbitrary storage abstractions atop of this sort of high-performance, low-level interface. Right? As a web developer, I can innovate on those APIs without waiting for those browser vendors or standards committees. And if that implementation is broken, I can fix it because, morally speaking, all that code belongs to me. So I can always fix my own implementation. So in summary, Atlantis makes me feel like Beyonce. I just feel like I'm just so free and so liberated, right? Living in a world of my own construction. So the point is that all of those nice features that I just showed you before, they are enabled because Atlantis gives web developers more control. So I hope that I've demonstrated in this talk three things, right? First, I tried to show you that modern web browsers make it difficult to create fast, secure, and robust web pages. Those problems arise because browsers use bad abstractions, and developers lack the ability to fix those bad abstractions. 
By refactoring the browser and giving developers more control, we solve a variety of problems, right? We allow developers to fix their own bugs, to add more concurrent interfaces, or to fix uh, sort of uh, performance features or, or performance bugs that they could not fix in the regular world, right? And we also allow developers to experiment with new execution models that may look nothing like the current web stack of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And I'm very personally excited about that because that traditional web stack has taken years off my life. I'm actually 12 years old, okay? <laughs> this is what the web has done to me. So it's a cautionary tale. Now, before we conclude, I would like to say that I'm a man of many interests. Uh, using the core set of talents that I show you here at the bottom, I've performed research on a variety of topics. So, for example, I've done some work that focused specifically on security. So in particular, how can we isolate mutually distrusting JavaScript libraries that live in the same page? I've also built some tools that allow web developers to fix uh, bugs that arise in applications that are widely deployed to end users. So for example, I've looked at tools for non-deterministic logging and replay in web applications. And I've also done research on cloud scale file systems. So for example, at last year's NSDI, I described how you can take an unmodified POSIX application, put it in a VM, run it in the cloud, and then expose that unmodified application to thousands of megabytes of I.O. per second. So in summary, the best way to think about me is like a Leonardo da Vinci type scientist, <laughs> okay? Someone who makes both broad and deep contributions to all of society. Now, is this a burden? The answer is yes, but it's a burden. <laughs> it's a burden that I gladly bear, okay? That's just the kind of guy that I am, okay? And so, very briefly, let me describe you know, what I think is a really interesting new direction in systems research, right? Because as a scientist, I'm always thinking about the future. So one aspect uh, that I'm really interested in is new systems abstractions for privacy, right? So in particular, I'm interested in this model that I call private logical machines. I made that term up. Don't try to steal it. I'm very litigious. I will sue you. I will win. Okay, so what do I mean by this? So what I mean is that, abstractly speaking, each one of you has a bunch of private data that's tightly bound to you, right? So this includes things like your Facebook photos and your LinkedIn data and so on and so forth, but also more serious stuff like your medical information, tax records, so on and so forth. And so in an ideal world, all of your interactions with that data would go through a private logical machine. Now this machine would have two properties. First, it would strictly follow your commands, right? It would only manipulate your data in ways that you allow. And second, when you turn off that machine, it disappears from the universe. No one else can turn it on, and your data is gone, right? The only way that you can get access to that data is to turn your logical machine back on. So a machine like this would be awesome because it would give us, the users, more control over the data that we put into cloud services. Now, of course, this isn't what the current world looks like. The way that the current world looks like is this. So on the left, your sort of single logical data set is actually sharded across a, a bunch of different service providers and it is those service providers who ultimately control your data, right? They actually own the bits and they, if they're benevolent, may allow you to specify some type of sharing policy, but often they don't, right? And then on the right, you have your personal devices, which kind of act like caches for your data, but the problem is that, like in MVC terminology, your devices are basically just like a view for a model and a controller that, you know, the man out in the cloud is sort of foisted upon you, right? That's kind of a bummer. So, you know, I think that, uh, you know, this architecture is problematic for reasons that are probably obvious to you. So uh, weird pixelated people in the data center can look at your information without you knowing. Um, the proverbial uh, man in the middle or network attacker can look at the bits that you're exchanging maybe. And then um, apparently Hezbollah can steal your laptop. I, it's, I, it's tough to find clip art for everything. So sometimes, sometimes you just take a hit and you whiff. So anyway, so, so there's a lot of problems here because for example, if someone steals your laptop, even if you were in private browsing mode, these modes actually leak information. They might be able to figure out where that you went, where the sites that you visited. So at a high level, I'm interested in thinking about what systems abstractions can we create to enable this private logical machine, right? And note that encryption is necessary but insufficient to solve this vision, right? Because imagine that you just simply, you know, uploaded encrypted data to the cloud. If the cloud ever computes on that data in clear text, game over, right? And so similarly, if you just use HTTPS to exchange data over the network, even the sizes of the encrypted objects that you exchange with the web server can reveal what website you're going to. Okay, so like maybe CNN has like one big object and four little ones, 
right, even when they're encrypted. Maybe BuzzFeed has a bunch of small objects, right, because it's all just compressed pictures of cats or whatever, right? So just looking at the sizes can reveal stuff, right? So encryption is necessary but insufficient to realize this vision. So there's a lot of interesting things we can do on both the server side and on the uh, client side. So on the server side, the crypto folks have come up with some really neat technologies for doing encrypted computation, right? So allowing cloud servers to essentially do things, execute functions on behalf of you over encrypted data in a way that the server doesn't understand you know, what exactly it's been asked to do. Now the challenge with those techniques, things like a garbled circuits for example, is that they are currently very slow. Like slow, like almost like heat death of the universe slow. Right? And so I think there are actually opportunities for the systems community to come in and provide some insights that can make these things faster. So for example, one very popular technique in the systems community is this separation between metadata and data. Right, where metadata is typically much, much smaller than the data. So maybe we could sort of use some of these techniques like garbled circuits only on the metadata, right? And then the data portion, we encrypt using fast things like AES or things like that. And then on the client side, I think there are a lot of interesting challenges with uh, private browsing modes. So as I alluded to before, incognito modes like on Chrome or IE or Firefox, they actually still leak data, right? So for example, what happens if you're in incognito mode and you go to CNN did you have to uh, do a DNS resolution for CNN? If the answer is yes, then maybe you've just left evidence in your DNS resolution cache of where you visited in private browsing mode, right? Or for example, you know, what if you're executing some JavaScript code uh, from CNN and that code gets paged out to the page file? Are you using an encrypted swap? Do you securely uh, deallocate that information? If the answer is no, you've just leaked information through your swap file, right? So I'm very interested in how we can create better private browsing modes, both by re-architecting the browser and perhaps more interestingly, by giving web developers tools to sort of refactor their, their content in ways that leave fewer client-side uh, traces of activity, right? So imagine that you could give web developers a compiler that, for example, automatically encrypted JavaScript code and sort of uh, enforce this, this invariant that unless the JavaScript code was executing actively, it would only be in encrypted form on the end user browser. Um, so anyways, there's a lot of interesting subtleties there. I'd be glad to talk about that uh, later if you like, but for now, I'd like to thank you for your time. We don't want to put Emacs in our kernel. Yeah. I think you can make a similar argument that I don't want to put a browser in my browser. So like, what, what is it that you think is compelling to keep about the browser model instead of just having you know, CNN or whoever ship me a binary, which can already kind of implement whatever abstractions they want? You know, that's a good question. I mean, I think there are some nice things about the current web model. So for example, we have this nice uh, you know, sort of CDN infrastructure, for example. The web gives you this nice ability to not have to install things, right? You can just sort of visit a thing without having to sort of permanently affect your machine in some sort of deep ways. But I think that you're right that, you know, we could just try to leverage only those features and then not try to sort of fault in all of these legacy things like the HTML stack and the JavaScript stuff and so on and so forth. So in other words, one way that you could view Atlantis is saying we're trying to distill that essence, right? So we do still seek HTTP, so we take advantage of, you know, the CDNs and stuff like that. And we do have this notion of origins, so we still try to isolate stuff by origins, which also seems nice. But then, yeah, you could just sort of use that as a sort of, uh, as a mechanism to deliver things that look more like sort of native code apps. So you're right about that. chance that we will ever use a browser like the browser architecture you suggested is about the same as the chance that Leonardo da Vinci plus Beyonce, you're their child. <laughs> so, well, I've got a surprise for you, da Vinci and Beyonce, come on! <laughs> <laughs> My question is, why not? I mean, you, you, may, you may just say, no, I disagree with the premise. Like, this is the way browsers should be, this is the way browsers will be. All of the kernels that we're using are microkernels. <clears throat> Therefore, all of the browsers that we're going to use are going to be microkernel browsers. Oh, or you could yes, explain yes, why yes. you think this is not yes. the way the world will go. Yes, yes. Chapter 18 of the battle between Eddie and James. So, so I mean, these, those are all valid questions, right? Uh, so 
So let me try to answer several of them and then remind me if I've forgotten the more important ones. So I think that, for example, microkernel stuff, right? So why aren't we all using microkernels? Well, it's true that strictly speaking, like no one has taken like the reference architecture that folks like, you know, Franz have come up with and said, like, here's what we're going to use. But I don't think it's the case that, you know, modern operating systems have not been influenced by those things, right? Now, it is true that some research has more impact than others. But like a great example is things for like, uh, like static driver verification. That used to be considered like something that only wizards would do. But now that's had a really big impact, you know, particularly in Microsoft, for example. But, you know, sometimes the arc of history is long. Now, to get back to uh, the specific issue of browsers, see, here's what I think about browsers. Uh, well, I think many things. I'll try to remove the most hateful parts. Uh, <laughs> I think that right now browsers are currently undergoing what Marx predicted would happen to capitalism, <laughs> to be torn apart by internal contradictions, right? And the reason that I say this is because now you actually have like research projects in Mozilla that are looking at, you know, how can we refactor the browser? There are actually research projects, not from MSR, but from like the IE side, who are looking at how can we refactor the browser. Now, I would argue they're taking too small of a cut, right? Like I would argue they should do something more fundamental. But I do think that eventually they will move towards something like this. Well, what now, the first thing that they'll take from your work? Yeah, so I think the first thing that they would try to take is they would try to take this notion of like the Atlantis kernel uh, sort of API, and then sort of like take all this nasty code they have right now, and then just try to refactor stuff into that mech, into that, that, that form. So you still have some C++ nastiness here, but it at least speaks that min cut. Because what that allows them to do is provide a very strong backwards compatibility story, because the web page facing stuff is all the same, but it allows them some of the nice extensibility uh, uh, advantages that they could sort of slowly page in. Right? Um, so I think that's what they do first. I mean, if you look at, like, let's say, Chrome, for example, you know, Chrome has gone to a multi-process architecture. Right? Firefox is trying to go to a multi-process architecture. It's been very painful for them. Um, you know, IE has done that as well. So I think there is sort of slow movement there. Um, but you know, to be frank, there are also sort of strong mercantilist pressures that prevent innovation sort of in the direction that we in the ivory tower might prefer. Right? So for example, right, Google has very strong and very obvious reasons for wanting the web to look certain ways. Right? So Google will do certain things that are designed to generate more ads for Google. Microsoft has other goals, which used to not be the same as Google, but which now, in fact, are the same as Google. Right? Because Google came up with Google Docs first, ergo Google should care more about the browser. Right? Before Microsoft had Office 365, browsers aren't as interesting. Right? Now we do have it. Now there's more pressure to innovate. So there's also that kind of grotesquery with the filthy lucre. But long story short, I do think we're moving in that direction. Uh, do you have a question? So I was going to ask, have you actually had conversations with the IE group, and, and what kind of reception do you get? Yeah, so uh, some of this, is this being shown externally, or is this? It's just hundreds of people. I mean, I'm sure I can tell you deep secret. So suffice it to say this, and this, this stuff is not super secret, but suffice it to say that, you know, even as recently as, like, say, three years ago, right, if I, if I would go to, like, the IE team and say, like, hey, like, I've got this crazy new thing, they'd sort of pull a quarter from behind my ear and say, you know, that's very good, young man. Go leave us alone, right? Um, I think now, because all the, web com all, all the technology companies now agree the browser is a real thing, people are more open to this stuff in general. So, I mean, I have talked to them sort of more seriously about this kind of stuff, but I can't speak specifically about some of it. Hardware APIs for GPU rendering or yeah. things like this. So, what's the story? Uh, you know, there. That is, uh, you know. Yeah. So, so we don't we don't know that we have sort of the 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 final story we'd like for that. So, you know, one thing that I didn't mention is things like how does Atlantis expose stuff like webcams, for example, right, or other peripheral devices. So the way we have it working right now is that we essentially have like a little device server that's sitting off to the side, like in the browser kernel. I didn't show you that. But then basically you can use sort of like this JSON-based like RPC mechanism to access those kinds of things. So almost think of it almost like a, like a USB type thing. There's a format that all devices have to speak if they want to interact with the web page and so on and so forth. Now, that's nice because it still provides good isolation. It's got sort of a nice sort of extensibility story of what happens when we add new devices. But you know, to get back to your question specifically about, let's say, the GPU, for example, we're not actually exposing raw sort of device IOCLs or whatever. So we're not quite sure what the best story for that is right now, to be, to be honest. Because you know, if you wanted to expose things like the GPU directly, you know, now you're getting this weird world where are you going to have verified, safe GPU code? Or how do you it, It's tricky, so, so I'm not quite sure. You know how that's different from the private logical machine idea? 
Uh, so I only know a little bit about that. I'm not deep into that. Is there a particular it's basically like a, a way to keep your data locally, but have apps that you can download and run on your data, but they can't basically talk to the outside world. Yeah, yeah. so I'm a little bit aware of you know, things like Mylar, for example. I mean, so, so there have been some, for example, browser plugins that look at, you know, what if when I sent my email to Gmail, I just automatically encrypted it? You know, so it's like Gmail doesn't necessarily know or it does not know, excuse me. But then when it comes back on the other side, I can decrypt it all sort of locally. Um, I think that those things are, are sort of a step in the right direction. But see, there's a couple, you know, one of the big problems of doing uh, encrypted cloud storage is that how do you sort of recreate this rich third-party infrastructure we have right now, right? And by rich, I mean things like right now, one reason why Facebook can add a lot of value is because they own all the Facebook data. Right? So they can sort of arbitrarily innovate in ways that might surprise and delight you, right? as well as horrify you with respect to privacy implications. Right? But you know, in a certain sense, when you tell someone, I'm going to put uh, all of the, the, the ownership of data in the user's hands, and that third-party services have to come to the user now, right? that's actually a very radical change. Right? Because now, for example, how is Facebook going to do things like exploratory data mining? Right? If it has to sort of somehow negotiate this morass of one you know, it's a sort of one-off policies that each user has exposed, right? Perhaps even more importantly, how do you preserve things like money flows, right? So we know, for example, that people will not pay for web services in general, right? And so, in fact, the reason why people sort of put up with some of these privacy violations is precisely because they don't want to pay for stuff. So, like, one of the biggest challenges in creating these encrypted cloud services is sort of allowing users to control, have more control over their data, allow users to set these security policies, but also preserving some type of revenue flow that uh, allows these cloud services to actually put food on the table, right? Like this is actually one of the biggest challenges of like these browser plugin solutions that sort of encrypt data on the way out and don't allow, for example, people to generate targeted ads on the server side. Like if enough people started doing that, why would, why would Google continue to run Gmail, for example? Because it could be if, if, if no one's gonna pay a subscription uh, price. So it's tricky. So I actually think that that, that, that notion of, of preserving revenue flows is one of the biggest sort of aspects in these privacy preserving services. One more question. Oh, so I use like 25 plus extensions on my browser right yeah. now. And I feel like looking at this architecture, I'm getting a little bit of loss of vision because I don't see how yeah. a lot of those extensions are going to work. Like one of them is a speed reading extension where I highlight mm -hmm. it and speed read the text now that all this extension sitting on my, and kind of I guess in the kernel would have access to is this bitmap now. How that's right. That... Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, so, so that's actually one of the sort of inherent challenges in sort of, you know, moving these things around because you're right that the kernel doesn't see things like, uh, like letters, you know, for example. So uh, what I think will end up happening is that um, there will end up, like for every, let's say, uh, extension or plugin you might imagine, there would be sort of like a crisply defined protocol of like what it, what it does, right? And so then if those protocols were well known, then pages themselves could sort of create like the client side of that protocol thing. And so, you know, in this new world, uh, basically a web page would have to explicitly opt in to that speed reading uh, plugin or whatever, which is actually much different than the way that things work today, right? Where sort of the browser can sort of single-handedly inject stuff into the page. But that is a big difference, you're right about that. I think the success of plugins in the new world depends on people being able to describe some reasonably concise sort of protocol level description.